Hello, YouTube. So this is Alec. I've uh, listened to many podcasts he did together with Russo. You can check their channel. It's called Blonde Biohacking. I've learned a lot from them. And then basically I just contacted, uh, contacted uh, Alec on the Instagram where we had uh, a little bit of chatting and all that. And uh, then I've decided to start filming podcasts for my YouTube channel and I invited him to be my first guest. So here we are. And in today's episode, uh, we'll be focusing, we'll be talking about how to basically manage your blood pressure through many different ways. Like we'll cover um, how to do it uh, with nutritional approaches, with uh, supplements like, you know, over-the-counter supplements that are that can be found in the local supplement store, as well as um, the medications and all the different ways that you can ma manage your blood pressure especially if you are an enhanced athlete that is using uh, any kind of performance enhancing drugs that we all know could, could potentially increase the blood pressure. So my first question for Alec would be like, how would you, I, I heard in one of your podcasts you did with Russo is first thing about the blood pressure is that you need to uh, find out what's the root cause of the high blood pressure, right? Yeah, exactly. So first of all, we need to establish a baseline parameter of like what's our baseline blood pressure looking like usually people do the mistake of just measuring it once a week or once a month when in reality that's just one snapshot of a point in time where you may be either you know spastic and overly excited and being in a pro you know sympathetic state so whether you you know had an argument with your girlfriend or your, you've been to the gym 30 minutes prior and you may get a you know a very high reading or you can have a very low reading and assume that you're fine when in reality you need to check multiple times during the day for let's say a week and then calculate weekly averages and compare you know in a month two months three months six months whatever how you're actually fluctuating same concept with your body weight right we need we check our body weight every morning and then assess how our diet is progressing whether we need more calories or less so it's the same concept now as far as you know, uh, defining our blood pressure, we also need to know where we want to be at, right? So in general, uh, having a blood pressure of, of about once, uh, 120 over 60, systolic versus diastolic, it's considered, you know, the optimal sweet spot. But, uh, you know, because we're athletes, we're, we have higher uh, body mass index, especially in the sport of bodybuilding, we can have somewhat elevated blood pressure and get away with it. So that's usually up until 129, over 79, which would be slightly elevated. Now, anything above 130 upwards to 145, over 80, 289 would be considered uh, stage one hypertension and above 145 over 90, it's uh, considered a hyper, uh, stage two hypertension, which is all the way up to one, uh, 180 over 120, which is hypertensive crisis and you can actually die in that situation. So uh, we need to establish where we actually are and then, you know, see how things are progressing. Now, as far as defining what are the uh, root cause of uh, elevated blood pressure, there it, it can be multifactorial. So we need to fundamentally try to maintain a lower body weight, even when bulking. We don't want to be excessively fat because the heavier you are, the more burden on your cardiovascular system, and that will, you know, mediate an elevated uh, blood pressure. So do not bulk like super hard, try to maintain a relatively leaner body weight even in the off season and try to be on top of your cardio uh, vascular activities even when bulking so that's something that's overall from from a health perspective pretty rational right now as far as you know other things that are impacting blood pressure especially with pd use is um, our androgens right and what they do is basically they directly affect the raw system the renin angiotensin aldosterone system that uh, mediates, uh, you know, intracellular and extracellular fluid. So steroids, they cause sodium retention, nitrogen retention. We are fuller, rounder on steroids, obviously. But that extra blood volume and water will increase the blood pressure to some extent. So when we pick our compounds, we need to meticulously pinpoint which we, uh, compounds we want to use in order to, you know, not get excessively bloated and carry all this unnecessarily extra weight. For, you know, you, we may look, you know, slightly fuller at the gym and whatnot, but the price that we're taking, you know, and the tool we're taking on our heart and kidneys, I don't think it's worth it, obviously. So we, we'll, yeah, as, this, yeah. as we go along in the discussion, we'll talk about, you know, which 
which uh, androgens you know are better or worse. But in general, it's a matter of compound selection and then you know maintaining a healthy diet. So people usually eat a lot of bullshit, you know, high sodium diet. They use steroids as a way to cheat on their diet because they can get away with you know not getting you know uh, as as much fat as they otherwise would be. But on the other hand, they're causing excessive amount of water retention that can, you know, acutely damage their, their organs and their health. So that's why, as, as you said, you're healthier right now, because even though you're taking PEDs, you're way more careful with your diet, your, with your electrolyte intake, with your water intake, and you're not putting shit in your body that otherwise would have been worse on you. So it's a matter of how you approach things in general, more so than, you know, just whether you're enhanced or not. So I think that's yeah. One, a, one more thing, one more yeah. thing I wanted to ask you about the sodium. So, do you think it's really the problem in sodium itself, or more in sodium potassium ratio? Because many people are, you know, eating way too much sodium but not enough potassium because they're kind of like not eating enough vegetables and they're eating rice instead of potatoes, which uh, we know that rice is like pretty much a very like micronutrient deprived food. You know, it's uh, mm -hmm. like Okay, it's a carb source, but it doesn't really have much, uh, many micronutrients. Yeah. So, for example, many bodybuilders would like uh, eat a ton of salt, but they wouldn't really care about their potassium intake. So, would you say this is like the main problem and not just like too high sodium? So, the, I fully agree the, with you. so yeah, the un unproper, unproper sodium to potassium ratio. Yeah, for sure. I mean, listen, just fundamentally, water follows sodium. So the more sodium you have independently of other electrolytes in conjunction with, especially with uh, inadequate amount of water. So what happens is if you have a lot of sodium in your diet and not enough water, you're going to hold even more uh, uh, water in, uh, in your body because aldosterone will get upregulated and you'll, you'll essentially you'll blow it up even more. So it's not just the potassium thing. It's also a matter of having adequate amount of uh, solid free water on top of, you know, your sodium intake. So people really screw up in this regard and they forget that in general, you know, doctors say you need two to three liters of water, you know, that's for overall health. But we're so much bigger than, you know, natural individuals who aren't bodybuilders, obviously. So our muscles require so much more water in order to have proper hydration levels. Now it's summertime when we're sweating, we're sweating, you know, we're losing electrolytes, we're, we're losing a lot of water. So people that, you know, neglect this and they dehydrate themselves and they eat a lot of sodium, they actually cause the water tension in the effect on the, on the raw system even more uh, profound. And also good thing you brought up potassium because people f uh, neglect the fact that in order for glycogen to be stored in the muscles, you need glucose, water, and potassium. Those are the, the main drivers uh, of, uh, of, uh, of glycogen storage. So without them, you cannot store glycogen. So because glucose is just a polysaccharated form, uh, well, glycogen is a polysaccharated form of glucose. So the thing is that you're absolutely on point on that, and also magnesium and other, uh, you know, electrolytes are extremely, uh, uh, extremely important in order to uh, maintain proper uh, water balance in the body. So yeah, for sure, having a, an increased amount of potassium will help. But the thing is that androgens themselves, because they directly impact our hormones, they, will, they're, they're, uh, they, are, uh, they do cause water retention fundamentally regardless. So it's more so having an appropriate amount of water intake plus potassium and not worrying as much on sodium as people are. Um, so that's, that's a huge mistake, mistake people do in general. So yeah, I'm absolutely with you on that uh, aspect. Potassium is super important. That's why I have you know, a lot of my clients, uh, drink, uh, tomato juice because it's very low in calories and it has like 2.5 oh, grams yeah. of potassium mm. per liter. So it's a, it's a very nice hack pre-workout to uh, yeah. facilitate uh, better pumps. I usually like to eat potatoes because first of all, they yeah. taste amazing to me. And second mm -hmm. of all, I just find them far more nutritious than, for example, eating rice or pasta that don't mm -hmm. really have any micronutrient value. Uh, so since we are at the nutritional approaches, how to manage blood pressure, uh, what 
would be like the other things that we could do in our diets to improve our blood pressure. So, for example, would you also recommend eating more fiber and avoiding, for example, like simple carbs and mostly sticking to like um, low glycemic index carbohydrates? Would you, say, would you say that has an impact too or not? Depends. So the glycemic effects of, of carbohydrates are, they matter when they start to matter. So if you're developing insulin resistance, whether that's through, uh, you know, genetic predisposition uh, and also excessive bulk over, you know, a prolonged period of time, those things add up, they build up. So that's when you basically what applies to pre, pre type two diabetics would apply for you as well. But if you're like on top of your game, if you're like lean, a lean, you know, uh, bodybuilder that's, you know, that uh, that's hormonally uh, uh, dialed in, then in that situation, whether you're eating, you know, a higher or lower glycemic carb, it's not going to make, uh, make a statistical difference in your overall health or physique. But yeah, over time, these things uh, add up. So that's why when I said prior, you know, one of the, the main uh, uh, vectors that drive hypertension uh, is sheer amount of body weight. So that directly on other aspects in other fields will cause other problems, including insulin resistance. And then all of these things would matter for sure. So if you're fundamentally healthy, if you're, you know, eating a, a balanced diet, you have, you know, you're, you're on top of your cardio regimen and you're not doing excessively stupid uh, 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 cycle designs, then you should be fine. You know, the, the, mm. the worst, the bad thing is that we're getting, uh, um, we're in a situation where people are dying, where, you know, bodybuilding has become the most unhealthiest uh, lifestyle because you have people that are taking and they're messing with, with drugs on every, on every notion, in every aspect with the, with the endocrine system, with the nervous system, with the uh, raw system, with our kidneys, with our liver, with everything. And when you're, you, when you cause a whole clusterfuck of, you know, uh, uh, whether drug induced or just you know uh, uh, drug induced plus poorly uh, uh, mediated diet and, and lifestyle choices, then it's very hard to pinpoint what's causing what and when to even begin trying to you know getting on top of things and mitigating what's what's going on. So it's a matter of being proactive and not getting to yourself to to uh, in those situations where you're like fuck, what do I do now? So the whole point of these discussions. And the whole biohacking movement and, and you know, the, the course that the fitness industry is trying to take right now is to prevent you becoming and, and being in the, those situations where it's very hard to get out of. And people, because they so identify themselves with the whole lifestyle and how big they are, you know, acutely or, you know, throughout their whole uh, lives, they do not want to take a step back or two steps back in order to make five forward. And they just think and and do nothing about it and then you know we have people in in chronic kidney failure uh liver failures and so forth so um the the, the whole logics and the fundamentals of it are where where it's rotten and where the the problems are, are in general yes thank you so now we covered pretty much everything i would say about like nutrition so you said we should uh we should take a look about our sodium to potassium ratio. So we are not just consuming too much salt and not enough potassium and also staying on top of our water intake, right? So we are hydrated. Yeah. Um, yeah. Other thing, for example, you mentioned cardio. Of course, we all know that cardio. And uh, magnesium, benefit. sorry. Yeah, cardio and magnesium benefit. But we'll talk more about magnesium in the uh, when we're when we're moving to over-the-counter supplements, right? Okay. So cardio, of course... Uh, lowers blood pressure right and mm -hmm. would you also say that like you could also besides the cardio do for example sauna that is like kind yes. of similar thing okay so it's pretty much the same right not necessarily because oh. when you're when you're when you're so like cardio uh, uh, i mean not the same but like yeah it has a very similar effect on the lowering of the blood pressure yeah because you're losing you're losing water weight you're losing electrolytes you're inducing uh an acute dehydrating process you're starting you know to lose uh body weight during the mm -hmm. during either cardio exercises or during the sauna the problem with the sauna is that it you can go overboard without actually noticing it because you're you're 
it's harder to gauge how much actually water you're losing with uh yeah with and you can probably deplete process. the the, the yes. electrolytes too you know yeah and that can backfire especially during you know uh, i mean when fighters are trying to make weight they rely on these things and that's when usually they they you know are in unpleasant and unfavorable situations from a health perspective with cardio it's harder to get yourself to those in those situations so i think mm -hmm. cardio is overall plus metabolically it's more advantageous so uh you're also burning off energy you're stimulating mtor c1 through just energy expenditure so in in a, in a whole bodybuilding concept i think cardio is more preferable to for this situation rather than just you know sitting in a sauna and trying to yeah, take the easy the easy way to, uh, <laughs> yeah. the easy route yeah so i'm definitely doing cardio if you saw on my instagram stories i, I yeah, decided yeah. i'm gonna just do it like year round no matter whether i'm on bulk or on a cut i'm doing cardio like pretty much that's smart every day okay maybe maybe there are like two days in a month when i'm not doing cardio for example if i'm like super busy that day or for example if i'm like sick or not feeling well but otherwise i really try to do my cardio every day because uh, not just because of the blood pressure thing but because of all the thousand other benefits that cardio has right you'll grow so, more yeah yeah i noticed that with myself because i'm kind of like body partitions nutrients better i'm more yes, insulin sensitive exactly. and, and also all that you know it is a stated uh, one of the main driving growth pathways in our body, M3C1, one of the vectors that directly impacted is energy expenditure. And when we're doing cardio, we're expending energy. So even that in itself is anabolic. So, you know, in the grand scheme of things, I, I, I saw an interview of uh, Chad Nichols and he had Ronnie Coleman do like even two hours of cardio in the off season. Why? Why is the biggest bodybuilder on the planet in the history of, you know, bodybuilding who was 300 pounds shredded you know he didn't need cardio right yeah but he did it regardless in the off season as well and you know rami was big on cardio when when working with with chad and you know all of these coaches that are you know coaching top end tier olympians they are onto something they, they may not explain it from a scientific perspective but through trial and error and just decades of experience they they're onto something and when i look at you know what they say and when they, then i you know uh uh intertwine it with my independent research i'm just like holy shit these people are right like they're onto something they're not you know retarded meatheads that are just saying shit for the sake of you know uh saying it there is something to it so you know it's it's i think you should be doing it year-round and when i did it you know i i grew better for sure yeah, of course. Uh, me too. I definitely noticed that like if I'm doing cardio, like food just goes more into the right places, if you know what I mean. So I'm not like yeah. if I'm sitting there and not doing cardio and just eating carbs, you know, I just get like super bloated and I like, you know, it like I'm getting insulin resistant and nothing uh, good is happening with my physique, you know. But if I'm actually like doing cardio in the off season, I can even like eat far more calories without a problem and I will just yeah. like I feel like I'll grow much more lean muscle and not as much fat tissue and water water weight as I was as I would if I would just like not do cardio and sit and eat all day here. Exactly. So, and you'll perform better in the gym too. Because when you're not bloated, when you have more energy, when your cardiovascular yeah. capacity is better, you can do more reps. You're not gonna guess out. You're not gonna be the dude that's gasping for air, even having three minutes of sex with his girlfriend. <laughs> or you know climbing up the stairs yeah, or having nosebleeds yeah. you know like you're going to be a functional machine where where in reality that's the whole point of it you want to be a fucking mm. machine you want to be on top of your a game you know why why would you want to be a, a, like an obese individual that's like all muscles yeah but like can't even walk up the stairs like that for sure will negatively impact their training so they're not going to be yeah. at their their high end of their performance so that will negatively affect their gains so for yeah. sure yeah so n next thing i wanted uh, to ask you about which is kind of like very interesting to me is um since we are at like nutritional and lifestyle approaches to managing blood pressure so 
another thing would be, for example, like stress and anxiety and like overall how nervous you feel. Because, for example, if I like, if I'm like super nervous and I go and measure my blood pressure, it will be super high. And then yes. maybe like half an hour later, if I calm down and do some meditation and just like breathe a little bit, it will go down a lot. So what, how would you comment on that? Like how important would you say to like, it is to like keep yourself at that uh, parasympathetic state. So you're not just, uh, so you don't feel as you're in that fight or flight state of st state of mind all the time, because I do feel that this kind of like directly increases the blood pressure. Yeah, for sure. You're right. And here's the thing. We have alpha and beta adrenergic receptors that uh, noradrenaline and adrenaline bind to they cause vasoconstriction, they increase heart rate and they increase blood pressure. Like that's what happens. Mm, so yeah, of course. When you're on steroids or any other androgens, super physiological levels of androgens and even normal, what happens is androgens themselves, they increase the adrenergic receptor expression, which means that when you're when you're uh when you have more noradrenaline in the body whether that's from uh let's say your mom's yelling at you and you start getting angry that effect will be more exacerbated and profound if you're on steroids that's why they call it roid rage it's real mm -hmm. but it's not interpreted in the mainstream properly from a scientific perspective it absolutely you know uh it's a real thing another uh, uh thing is that Androgens themselves, they facilitate noradrenaline and adrenaline secretion. So they make us more edgy. So that, by definition, will cause us to have higher likelihood of blood pressure spikes throughout the day. Because we yeah. cannot be chill and then all the time, you know, things happen to ourselves to, to our, in, in our life. You know, somebody mm. will fucking honk you with their car. Somebody will tell you, you know you'll get, you know, uh, you'll be on the edge. And if you're somebody that's not chill, that's naturally aggressive, that will exponentially cause uh, these effects to be more profound. And those acute spikes in blood pressure that you're saying th th that are happening even to you, the more they happen towards, uh, uh, you know, within the day, within the 24 hours, the more you know that will build up over time and yeah, you have of course, you know sense. chronically elevated blood pressure that's yeah. why when we started this conversation i said you cannot just do one measurement and say oh i'm good or i'm bad yeah. because you know things shit happens in our day right so we have to you know the best uh, 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 the best times you want to check your blood pressure is basically around 2 hours upon waking up if your circadian rhythm is, is proper because cortisol naturally gets elevated, you know, to in order to wake us up. So that's when you want to see where you're at. Then 30 to 45 minutes after exercise to see how you, you respond to, you know, how your blood pressure and your nervous system are handling with stress that you've induced upon yourself. And another, uh, you know, situation where it's, you know, it's, it's, it's feasible and, and, and pretty much uh, recommended for you to check your blood pressure is, a few minutes after actually having a fight verbally or whatever with somebody. So you can see daily occurrences, how they affect you, right? Because when mm -hmm. you see it, you know, at the doctor's office and you're calm, you know, you're, you know, joking around with the nurses, you know, whatever, that's when you're calm. So your blood pressure may be significantly better, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that happens throughout the day to you. So you want to put yourself in this, into situations where you likely have higher blood pressure and see what happens then. So I, I actually took this to a more extreme, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, level where I did a 24 hour holter monitor. So I had a blood pressure cuff on my arm for 24 hours. And that day, uh, and I also, I had um, uh, a holter on my heart. So I saw my, you know, my heart rate and my, uh, you know, uh, all of the basic parameters regarding, you know, the, the heart's function. So that day I also did stimulants. I took ephedrine. Three hours uh, um, later, I took some loaders of cocaine and I took things. <laughs> yeah, I, made, I basically deliberately caused a situation within that day that may happen, you know, once a year, for example. Maybe I'm at a party or, you know, I wanted to see what actually happens when, I'm on gear and I do drugs or I, you know, fight with my mom or I wanted to see the worst possible day, 
how that may affect my health acutely. So it was very interesting that that day, I, rem I remember, well, I, I, I went for the results three days later to the doctor's office, and he basically told me, because he, he could see my heart rhythm and everything, and it was labeled during which time frames in the day. So he said, okay, on Friday at 2 p.m., uh, you know, this happened, and the, like I had a few instances of arterial fibrillation of AFib, which is very scary, and I had one occurrence of, um, what was the name? It was ventricular tachycardia. So those kind of arrhythmic, uh, arrhythmic uh, uh, changes can actually acutely kill you. That's how Rich Piana died. Because um, if you if you if your heart just goes out of rhythm and you pass out, unless they have a defibrillator on hand, somebody to shock you back into you know into existence, you're gonna you know suffer uh, brain damage. So even if you, if they save you minutes or hours later, you'll probably be gone. So that really scared me, and that really uh, you know strived me away from stimulant use because I realized, oh shit. I cannot get away with things that I used to when I was natural, when I was way lighter, you know, when I was like uh, 30, 40 kgs lighter and, you know, I didn't have all these uh, uh, endocrine and neurological differences that I do have now. So this is really important. And, and the reason why I say this, obviously, uh, is because I know a lot of the listeners are, you know, let's be real, we're guys, you know, in, in our 20s. We, we may find ourselves in situations where, okay, we're at a party or we're, you know, doing, you know, reckless shit. These things can really uh, uh, cause, you know, problems that we, we may not have a, a do-over. We may, you know, suffer it acutely and be gone. So there's sometimes it's, it's actually worthwhile, you know, having everything into consideration and asking yourself whether, you know, this is actually worth it or not. So... Uh, it's very important, but yeah, your state of mind and your nervous system is directly link, linked to your uh, endocrine system, and you have to be chill, practice meditation. Cardio in itself is meditating, so and in, in relaxing, if it's you know medium in intensity or just walking your dog, listening to music. So those kind of activities will greatly make a difference in one's overall health. If it's if it's practices that are followed day to day to day over months and years because those actually become yeah. lifestyle changes mm. so when you were uh, mentioning the stimulant so in general like uh, caffeine or ephedrine or pretty much any other stimulant like mm -hmm. um would you say like we forgot to mention this in uh, nutritional approaches so probably one of the things would be also to like not go too crazy on like your coffee or energy drinks or that stuff kind of stuff, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, also, would you say that like, if I, for example, today drink coffee, and I start drinking more and more and more and more coffee, I will eventually develop a tolerance to this caffeine. But does this mean that because I'm developing the tolerance to the caffeine, that caffeine won't that negatively impact me? No, no, no. Okay. no. that's the thing. You're gonna have a tolerance from um, central nervous perspective, where like, you're not gonna get the drive out of it. But it's still gonna cause vasoconstriction because that's what it does. Yeah, it's still gonna increase mm -hmm. your heart's contractility. It can mm -hmm. still mediate, you know, uh, uh, fluctuations unfavorable in your heart rate, in your heart rhythm. So all of these things, they, they the negative still stand. Same thing with clen, for example. Let's say you start off at twenty uh, micrograms, right? Yeah, makes sense then, for clen. I was, uh, I was asking for like let's say coffee so um Same thing. even if yeah of course even if i drink for example five cups a day and i don't feel it at all that's still kind of bad for me right yeah so for, for sure. example my mom she's like really addicted to coffee so she is like just <laughs> drinking coffee from when she wakes yeah. up up until she goes to sleep right and she's like mm -hmm. oh uh, but it doesn't affect me like i have a tolerance to it so it's not bad for me but yeah i i i should uh, tell to her that sh she should stop or at least as, uh, as reduce the alcoholic. it a bit. Yeah. Alcoholic. <laughs> they can drink a whole bottle of wine and they're like oh well i don't feel it right <laughs> yeah, yeah. meanwhile they're right. they're killing their, their their serotonin levels they're killing their liver they're causing organ problems that doesn't necessarily like they don't have to 
actually notice the benefits of it. So just because you don't feel the positive doesn't mean that the negatives aren't happening. They are. Yeah, There's no way around it. So same thing with clan, same thing with everything. You know, I've seen people take, you know, even 120 micrograms of clan and they're like, oh, I don't feel it anymore. I don't shake. I'm like, yeah, but re- like, go measure your heart rate. Like it I, fucking does that to you. <laughs> I've I've uh, once accidentally uh, overdosed it. So oh shit! Basically, I wasn't <laughs> I wasn't taking clen- I wasn't taking clen for a year straight, and then I mm. was uh, on a winstrol cycle, you know. And I just had the clen at home. I was uh, having the the pharma how it's uh, the Hilma, if you maybe know. Uh-huh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, mm-hmm. basically, the clan and the Winstrow bottle were exactly the same. There was just uh, on one it right oh, it clan and on one right it uh, Winstrow. So you know, I have those little like plastic bottles where I put my daily supplements mm-hmm. and that you know. And I was taking Winstrow, and <laughs> in the morning I woke up and I was like throwing uh, Winstrow into my uh, bottles, right? But uh, I. I switched the bottles and it was actually clean, you know, I don't know how, how could this happen to me, but like, uh, it was a good lesson. So then, yeah, basically I took the first dose. I didn't really feel it much because it was, I think like, uh, 20 microgram, no, 40 micrograms or something Four. like that, you know, because it was f- dose 40 per pill, I think if mm-hmm. I'm not wrong. Um, and then basically I come to a second dose and I swallow two more pills and it was like two, uh, 120 micrograms. And I wasn't taking clan. I didn't have any tolerance to it. So I wasn't taking mm-hmm. it for a year straight, you know. And then all of a sudden I start, uh, I start feeling that my heart rate is like 120, 130 for no reason. I was like, wait Shit. a minute. Why? Why is my heart rate so high? Like I took Winstrol. Oh, wait a minute. I go check. Oh, fuck. It was clan, right? And <laughs> yeah, it was uh, literally a horror story. So basically I was just um, for the next six hours. I was just sitting on couch hoping that I don't die. Uh, basically, my heart rate was like uh, 130, probably. I didn't have an Apple Watch oh, back shit. then to measure it, but this was like super high. Like I was doing cardio for six hours, literally. And oh uh, after six hours, I think things started to calm down slowly. Of course, I didn't sleep all night this day, you know, because I was uh, <laughs> steamed out as fuck, yeah. you know. But um after six hours, let's say things started to calm down and um, basically, let's say after 24 hours, I could say that I was fine. So I survived. After that, I also had my heart checked. I mean, not immediately after that, but uh, mm-hmm. later on, you know, and all that. So luckily there wasn't any like damage or anything like that. But uh, at the time I thought like I'm going to die yeah, or totally. something, you know, because it was fucking so scary like but as i said yes it was a good lesson so from now on i'm just like super careful about uh, every pills and everything so um i don't even have climate home home anymore because i basically don't even use it so i only use it for like last four to five weeks prior to competition mm-hmm. otherwise just don't i just don't touch it because uh it's it's really a horrible drug to me. Like I really don't like being on clan. So I, feel- uh, I like I like roids, but uh, clan is uh, like a nightmare. I I, I don't want to touch it if there is no need for it. So I would only use it for those like last four weeks when I need to like lose those last layers of body fat when clan can actually be useful. But like I see people doing clan for like no reason like just mini cut Mm -hmm. or they even do it during the off season to stay leaner and stupid stuff like that you know (laughs) i don't so like first i have a few questions i mean not towards you because uh, i I, we're on the same page but in general for people so why would you take clean in general like why not take something with a lower with a shorter half-life salbutamol albuterol Things that are the same thing as clan, they are beta receptor agonists, they're sympathomimetic drugs, but rather than having a half-life of 36 hours, they have four to eight hours half-life. So let's say you want to burn more fat during your cardio, right? So why not take salbutamol or albuterol pre-cardio, the only thing maybe in conjunction with growth hormone to facilitate more lipolysis. And then, you know, eight hours, nine hours later, when it's time for you to maybe sleep or do, you know, or come down, you don't get that effect anymore. Cause 
even even percentage wise, if you look at how effective clenbuterol is from a caloric expenditure standpoint, it really doesn't even burn that much more fat. Like we're talking about like 250 calories, 300 at most. So like, is that even worth it? Like, is that worth putting your heart, you know, with in a, in a catecholaminic overdrive? I don't think so. And again, so like, for example, take the cramps that people get, the clean shakes and cramps. The cramps are from uh, uh, taurine depletion. Well, it, it, it depletes taurine mostly in the heart. Like how scary it is to to know that it, it directly impacts your heart and it depletes it of a uh, of taurine. And like, what if you have an arrhythmia? Like people actually have done more damage to themselves with diuretics and clean use than actual steroids acutely because yeah, it can kill you. You you screw mm. up your trend cycle, you'll be screwed with acne or hair loss or neurological problems or libido problems for months, maybe whatever. Like this can actually kill you on the spot mm. and then there's no do-over. So like how stupid would that be? And also in the context of bulking on clan, how would you stay leaner on it? Like you're going to, yeah, you're going to burn a few extra calories, but you'll have to make up for them with diet in order to be at a surplus. So like it, it, it's, it's utterly stupid, I think. I mean, it, it just yeah, makes no I sense. And about people, the drugs, they, about they, the they, drugs they, that... Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry? Continue. <laughs> uh, about the, the drugs that you said, uh, why don't we use... Uh, those instead of clam, to be honest, I never heard about those, you know? So that's why really? here I, I was like, always thought like, okay, before the competition, uh, you're doing clam for this many weeks, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I was like, I'm kind of new in this pharmacology stuff. So let's say after two years ago, I didn't know that much. So I was just like sticking to the things that were known to me and that I kind of like knew, you know? So I wasn't really diving that deep into those new drugs or. <laughs> imagine, imagine. Imagine taking, let's say, a 36-hour half-life cocaine. I mean, how stupid yeah. that sounds, right? <laughs> so, like, if you want to have, if you want to agonize the beta-2 receptors, if you want to have a bronchodilation, a more uh, a, a caloric, uh, a more cardiovascular capacity, that's why clan is fundamental use. That's why people that with asthma take it, right? To 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 uh, cause bronchodilation and to to increase uh, oxygen in the in the lungs. So if you want to have that advantageous effect, just take something with short half life because those drugs beta two receptor agonists are really easy to obtain. Uh, you know, people with asthma in every country they have sprays. You know, so you can you can buy an inhaler or buy off of somebody with an asthma. It's the same thing. You may just need more puffs. But you'll get that effect. You'll increase. You'll, yeah, you'll notice immediately sense. the jump mm -hmm. in heart rate, the slightly elevated body temperature, you know, the increased cardiovascular uh, capacity, and then just make use of it during your your training session and be mm -hmm. done with it. Like, who the fuck would I want to be on the edge for thirty six hours? Like, it makes no sense. And also, every time you redose it, you're causing a compounding effect because you're spiking the blood plasma concentration. So, like. People do not take these things at the same time. So, like, they would wake up one day at, let's say, 6 a.m. and take their, you know, three pills of clan. And then the next day, they may not even sleep and they may take them, at, like, I don't know, before going out uh, an hour earlier. So, like, these kind of fluctuations that are inconsistent cause this in the bloodstream. And yes, when we're talking sense. about something that directly impacts the adrenergic receptors and adrenaline in our heart, and everywhere, like that can be really dangerous. Same thing with even with uh, with DNP. People actually kill themselves because they overdose it because it has a very long half life, and it just it has the the compounding effect that when they, when it builds up, they're like, holy shit. So that's the same concept, you know. Take it slow. Take take mm -hmm. the same thing with a lower half life, with a shorter half life, and get the most out of it if you wanna go that route. And it's not even mandatory at all. So. You know, it's just a matter of, you know, re reading up and researching what you're taking and whether there's a safer and smarter alternative to it, you know. So, yeah, uh, it's, it's pretty it's pretty funny when you think of it, how easy these solutions are and how in their in our faces are they are. But like nobody even, you know, gives a shit about, you know, just putting the time and effort to think about it. 
Okay, let's maybe move on now to, so we stick more to the topic, so we're not mm-hmm. just like jumping too much, because um, mm-hmm. we're at 40 minutes now, so um, okay. I, we have two more points to cover. So mm-hmm. next thing I would like to discuss is like, since we are at blood pressure management, like what natural over-the-counter supplements would you recommend to someone that has uh, elevated blood pressure? And let's say, let's say I'm that one, even though my blood pressure is fine. So let's say I have a ele- elevated blood pressure. I do the nutritional thing that you uh, advised me to do. I do the cardio and all that, but my blood pressure is still elevated. So maybe before I jump onto medications like ARPs, mm-hmm. ACE inhibitors and that stuff, you know, or Cialis, and all this kind of stuff, you know, mm-hmm. maybe I want to try something, uh, some natural supplements that could uh, lower my blood pressure. So what would those be in your opinion, like fish oil, garlic, or w- what would you recommend to me? So, so, okay. So first of all, when we're talking just in general about supplements, they're add-ons. So supplements, if everything's on point, if you're not lacking certain minerals or vitamins or whatever, Using more of them in general will not make a statistical difference to the point of making a big difference where you're just going to, you know, uh, manage the the issue like that. But in general, you know, magnesium, for example, is very important because it it dilates blood vessels. So rather than taking a pharmaceutical drug that like an ARB or an ACE inhibitor, you can just increase your magnesium intake and, you know, facilitate a, no, a decent amount of vasodilation. How, how many milligrams pressure. per day would you? So like, I, I, I wouldn't say in general for everybody, because like people that are watching this may be 15 year old mm. girls versus 30 year old, you know, monsters on trend. So like, <laughs> there's a huge discrepancy of who the viewership may be here. But like in general, taking like 500 to 750 milligrams of magnesium shouldn't harm anybody. And potentially mm. it, it may bring a lot to the table. Uh, a part of, you know, the, the everything we discussed prior has a way greater significance. Uh, as far as also supplements, things like carditone, um, garlic that you mentioned, or and, and even uh, having a, a higher omega-3 diet relative to omega-6 would cause, uh, um, would attenuate inflammation. Because like we're, when we're in a pro-inflammatory state, whether that's from immune issues or improper diet or whatever the cause may be, one of the ways that our body will be affected is potentially through increased noradrenaline and blood pressure and more cortisol because cortisol lowers uh, inflammation. Like that's a super important hormone. When we're in a pro-inflammatory state, all of these things are facilitated and over time will impact us. So you want to take things that are naturally... um, that would would you know attenuate the the sympathetic nervous system that that are relaxing like even taurine is it, it, it decreases neuroinflammation and systemic inflammation maybe uh, if somebody has problems with their gut even beta uh, uh, not beta and I mean glu- uh, uh, glutamine supplementing with glutathione NAC so all of these supplements that are you know uh, geared towards lowering systemic inflammation can directly impact the blood pressure as well hmm, if it's mediated through, through yeah. that. So and as uh, um, uh choline, alpha GPC, those kind of supplements that they, they have their independent use for other things, but they can greatly help you in this regard if one of the driving issues is you know inflammations and other things. So uh, just supplementing with with uh, these kind of things, I think would uh, would be advantageous. Um, but outside of that, I would uh, I would gear more to lifestyle and dietary practices, and if needed, pharma- uh, pharmaceutical intervention. So that's just my outlook on on, on this. What do you have okay. to add from a uh, supplement standpoint? Um, no, I kind of like agree with everything you said. Maybe I was a little bit. Uh... Like I didn't know that, for example, glutathione is that much directly correlated to blood pressure. So I was never like, uh, you know, Mm -hmm. I'm taking glutathione for also the blood pressure, you know. Um, But yeah, interesting. Like I always learn something new like every day. Um, So Mm -hmm. um, I maybe also wanted to ask you about the like Astralagus uh, root extract because Mm -hmm. some bodybuilders usually recommend it for the blood pressure. Like what's your look on this one? Uh, so I talk actually with Ian Valer, his Chris Bumps' trainer, 
uh, when I was talking about my autoimmune condition, and you know, we, Chris also has the Berger syndrome, uh, which directly impacts the kidneys and autoimmune and, uh, condition. And I asked, you know, what what's his supplement stack in order to help you know uh, kidney function, um, attenuate blood pressure, and so forth. And one of the things that he mentioned in his protocol, like he basically just copied it and pasted it to me, there was a, a citrus bergamot and astrologus root. They were in the protocol. Uh, I think they were like three times per day uh, mentioned. I don't recall dosages. I need to look it up. I'll just forward you later the, the message from him. Uh, I think they have uh, Bumstead and those bodybuilders have, uh, they don't uh -huh. have the separate supplements, but I think they don't take like those stacks, you know, so they have kidney mm -hmm. stack, liver stack, and they yeah. have much of uh, the stuff in there, you know, so. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah, so that's what I wanted to say. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I haven't, I haven't dug uh, deep into this uh, in, in um, uh, the pharmacodynamics uh, of these actual uh, supplements, how they affect. But I do suspect that one of the the mechanisms of actions uh, would be uh, blood pressure management, because like, how would you save the kidneys unless we're talking improving insulin sensitivity or blood pressure? Because those two main factors are what damages damage the kidneys and inflammation so and, and dehydration probably right and the hydration yeah, yeah exactly so so uh, uh we covered the hydration of how important it is but like from a from a renal perspective what damages the kidneys is the blood pressure uh basically pushes protein through through the glomeruli they are like filters on top of the kidneys and when protein particles go through the glomeruli they get damaged and that's how uh, a kidney uh, uh, kidney disease progresses. There are stages, you know. So uh, uh, that's why managing blood pressure is super important. And the other factor is uh, 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 insulin resistance. Because when you're when you're uh, when you have high glucose levels, when when you you don't have proper insulin management, uh, what glucose management? What happens is the the nerves uh, of the kidneys are also being uh, locally damaged. So that will impact negatively renal blood flow, which will basically cause even tissue necrosis. And the third, uh, you know, uh, uh, main problem would be inflammation. That's why I, I covered, uh, I touched upon it uh, with the supplements, because inflammation directly uh, can, can cause scarring of the kidneys or other organs, and you know, and also drive off blood pressure and, and every other uh, vector that we, uh, you know, mentioned prior. So. You know, it's a cascading effect that are multifactorial, but also they intertwine with another and they complement each other. So it's more so trying to, you know, address everything rather than just focusing on just solely one thing because blood pressure can be downstream, you know, explained toward via 30 different things. So, yeah, uh, of course. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I think we've covered supplements. You, is mm -hmm. there anything more you want to add? You can add it. Uh, and then we... Oh, say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one more thing that I, you know, I can think of is maybe um, for people that are not hypertensive, but are you know, geared towards uh, uh, maintaining proper uh, uh, kidney health as well, um, would be even supplementing with um, uh, baking soda tablets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, twice per this. day or even three times per day to lower acidity because our our lifestyle our overly you know high protein intake even the drugs that we're taking they have a lot of you know solvents they have you know alcohols and whatnot they they increase systemic acidity in our body so we tend to overlook this but th those things can be damaging uh, on from a renal perspective and i think uh just trying to balance that it's it's something that you know it's very easy uh but the, the on the flip side it can cause acute increase in blood pressure so mm -hmm. you know for people that are not hypertensive they may want to implement baking soda into their uh their daily routine okay so before we move on to the medications for the blood pressure i would like mm -hmm. to touch one more thing that you started at the beginning of the podcast and that is the for those of you who are enhanced, of course. So the proper selection of uh, anabolic androgenic steroids. So you can manage blood pressure just by picking your steroids smi smartly. So for yeah. example, so you don't stack like the most uh, 
aromatizable compounds together like you know yes. some guys like to do things like you know test deck a deeble, and then of course their blood pressure is like through the roof like 180 yes. over <laughs> i don't know what so but maybe instead of like uh picking the most like how to say uh, the most horrible combination of androgens for your blood pressure maybe instead of like uh, test deck a deeble, you maybe do um test their kind some winstrol or anavar instead of the D- anabol just so you like uh, decrease that stress that you've put on your heart by combining all these three um androgens together that we all know all three can potentiate the water retention and make you like super bloated and all this water retention in combination with the activation of angiotensin 2 and other pathways that um through which androgens could increase blood pressure everything in combination then can make you like super hypertensive so uh in my opinion like the best if someone is hypertensive like the best is to stick to steroids that don't uh, aromatize and that that don't uh, cause excessive water retention so in that case that those would be uh dht steroids so i i wonder what's uh, your look on that I think before I get into this uh, in specific, there's one thing we overlooked, uh, which is, you know, super important. And also that's also uh, blood viscosity. So androgens, oh, yeah. they, mm-hmm. they increase, they have uh, erythropoietic effect and hematopoietic effect. So they, they signal the kidneys to increase uh, uh, erythropoietin, which signals the bone marrow to produce more red blood cells. But they also independently do affect the bone man, uh, bone marrow, and they cause they induce polycythemia via both mechanisms. So and yeah, and then if you're polycythemic, then automatically you yeah, your blood your pressure blood, increases, right? Yeah, because your because blood it, volume. Yeah, it's the blood gets thicker, and then the heart needs yes. to work harder to, to pump, pump harder. Through, yeah, yeah, exactly. So yes. th- so that's a, a huge problem, and. The, uh, another problem that's in line and we also mentioned is inflammation because when we have inflammation, D-dimer and other biomarkers get uh, affected and that can directly cause the blood vessels to be stickier. So it's not just a matter of viscosity, but also uh, if the blood vessels are stickier, the blood flow will be also uh, uh, even harder to, mm, the, the, the yeah. heart will have a harder time pumping through the the. Uh, pumping the blood so that's why we also don't want to take harsh androgens because the higher their androgenicities in general correlates with uh, a, a, um, you know a more profound hematopoietic effect but that doesn't necessarily th- that's not absolute because in the case of, of boldenon for example it's not overly androgenic but it does have you know a profound hematopoietic effect uh but uh, but that's a huge factor so we need to uh, supplement with uh, or Within the pharmaceutical line, like something uh, like an aspirin, for example, baby aspirin, uh, 80 milligrams per day, and monitoring ENR and prothrombotic time, you know, the coagulating factors in our body in order to prevent things like clotting uh, and, 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 and basically increasement of blood pressure like that. So uh, back to the, the steroid aspect, you're absolutely right. We don't want to take things that are overly going to exert the, the raw system and facilitate water retention because that by definition will increase blood pressure. Uh, as far as your suggestions about the DHTs, that's true. There, most of them will not cause uh, any significant elevation in blood pressure. The problem I personally have with DHTs is that in general, they're, they're not really uh, that anabolic compared to other steroids. So uh, if the whole idea is to maximize hypertrophy and muscle protein synthesis, um, relying on DHTs as the driving force for this is not optimal. But from a blood pressure perspective, yeah. So I think it's a matter of picking a cycle where you're going to use the DHT drugs as add-ons to prevent, um, you know, bloating, excessive estrogenic side effects, but still rely on things like nandrolone, for, for example, or, or even testosterone. That would be the driving anabolics, anabolics for muscle growth. So like, Mm -hmm. for example, if you're, you can take like a low dose of testosterone, like 125 milligrams, which is like basic TRT, true TRT, not bodybuilding TRT. 
And you, you can add on top of that something like 350 milligrams of NVP. And then in conjunction with that, you know, a low dose of Anavar or th- something like that, that's still yeah. re- like decently anabolic. It's not going to facilitate water retention. It will potentially attenuate water retention from test and angelo and, you know, give us more gains without, you know, screwing ourselves uh, mm. with hypertension. So, so, so what, if I were to ask you, like, what steroids would you say are like directly the worst for the blood pressure and what are the best? So, for example, mm-hmm. would you say like that, like things like trend, the anabol, these are definitely like uh, the most, um, they have the most, um, how to say, likelihood uh, of likelihood causing, of mm-hmm. causing hypertension. Yeah. So a bigger question, a better question is the drug combination. Because like, uh, for example, yeah. if you take high testosterone and take nandrolone, you're going to have way more blood pressure problems than if you were to take nandrolone standalone. From mm-hmm. a blood pressure perspective, because again, it's a matter of the drug combination, how it affects us in, uh, on an endocrine uh, level, that will directly impact, you know, uh, water balance. So, for example, if you go high test, high nandrolone, you're gonna your prolactin will most likely elevate. You're gonna have more estrogenic, you know, uh, uh, effects and progest- pro- progesterogenic effects, and you'll be a water buff- uh, buffalo, and you'll have more blood pressure problems. Then had you taken twice the amount of nandrolone without the testosterone, for example. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it's a matter of drug combination, not necessarily solely the the the, the, the androgens themselves. But if I have to, you know, pick some of the worst, I would put uh, uh, Dibol, for example, in this uh, negative uh, uh, drugs of choice because it converts to methyl uh, estradiol, which is a more potent uh, form of estrogen than standard estradiol A2. So people really tend to bloat on Dibol and add that on top of testosterone or anything else. It's a recipe for disaster. Then you have people... Uh, the, the other ones are... Pre- individual pharmacokinetics and dynamics really matter here because some people on on trend for example have horrible bl- blood pressure and some have pretty decent blood pressure or rarely any any uh, uh, fluctuations but trend would be one of the worst considering how endogenic it is mm-hmm. how pro-inflammatory it can be uh and overall how sorry oh my god sorry i had to... no problem so from, from that perspective, trend would be one of the worst. Um, anything, any form of you know, methyl trend, uh, a- any variation of trend or halo testing. And overall, the, the, the harsh androgens would be, you know, something you'd want to stay away from. And the safer one would be the safer one would be the DHTs, the Mastrons, the yeah. Anavars, the Prima Bolans. You know, uh, lower what's, uh... of, yeah. Uh, what's interesting, like some, sometimes I even notice that like adding masteron to testosterone, for example, can even decrease the blood pressure, you know, because yes. uh, if testosterone by itself, it's like the wet compound, you know, so it kind of mm-hmm. like makes you hold on to more water and uh, increases the blood pressure via this way. And then when you add, for example, masteron on top, like all of a sudden uh, that bloat is uh, kind of reduced. So I myself, mm-hmm. I... I usually every cycle I do, I kind of like to run Mastron in it uh, first mm-hmm. because I uh, I find Mastron to be like I really tolerate it well, like I don't get any like side effects from it. But I mostly use it to like it's not I don't find it that strong, so I don't notice any like significant muscle or strength gains from Mastron. Mm-hmm. Um, it's I definitely find it m- much more weak than, for example, Winstrol or Anavar when it comes to like strength gains Agreed. and uh, and uh, muscle gains. Uh, but I use it mostly to like um, because I, if I'm using like just test, you know, by itself without the Mastron, I don't like the way I look. You know, I'm just like yeah. I hold way too much water. If I eat a high carb diet, I'm just bloated. But but for example, when I uh, add Mastron to it. I I really like this synergy of test and masteron because it kind of like removes the uh, estrogenic side effects from the testosterone. Therefore, I don't need any kind of AI or anything. I just can I can just get with like ratio one to one test to masteron, and I'm pretty much like 
really fine. And like, yeah, Master on it adds also to the strength of the cycle, but mostly I look on it as a cosmetic drug, as a mood booster, yeah. because I I uh, usually also feel very mentally good on the sure. Master on. And so, for example, maybe instead of doing like someone who is like thinking of uh, doing uh, 600 milligrams of test, maybe it would be wiser to do uh, 400 milligrams of test and something like two to 300 milligrams of masteron and you would go away with uh, fewer fewer side effects and make yeah. pretty much the same gains in my opinion. I agree with you on that. The, the thing is something very similar. So what you said is, uh, Russo, for example, I coach him and he started off fat on TRT uh, with a baseline blood pressure of 140 over 90. So like he was going, you know, in the stage two hypertension and everybody in the comment section was, oh, you need to put him on an ARP, on this, on like 30 drugs, you know, for blood pressure, for this and that. I'm like, chill. So I dropped his testosterone dose to 125, 150 and added nandrolone. And then later on, even added EQ. And people were like, oh, his blood pressure will be so high, blah, blah, blah. He lost like eight to, eight to nine pounds. And his blood pressure is now below 130 over 80. So the point is that what, what, what you just said, if you uh, 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 attenuate the, the war intensive effects, the effects on the raw system from the wet estrogenic compounds with either DHTs or even boldenone, because boldenone does compare to uh, to an estrogen, uh, uh, AI-like metabolite, the um, uh, methylene boldenone is the same drug as 17-beta uh, hydroxy examestin. So it does convert to... Uh, to a metabolite that it is essentially an anti-estrogen. So that can also help you with blood pressure. Uh, I had another client who I prepped. He was, his baseline was even in the 155s uh, of blood pressure. Um, he, he's a soldier uh, here. So like his job is very strenuous, very stressful. He, we did a prep and at the end of the prep, he was also on, on, on some trend on Mastron. Mm -hmm. His blood pressure was, uh, uh, you know, below 120 over 80. So, like, it's the, the worst things regarding blood pressure are body weight and diet and electrolyte uh, intake. So, shitty diet will cause, you know, uh, uh, over, like, over consumption of, of sodium, not enough potassium, magnesium, dehydration, you know, uh, water retention. So, most of these problems are solely mediated through our diet and lifestyle. And these drugs can, you know, very easily exacerbate the problems, but they can also uh, uh, lower and attenuate the problems if they're used correctly. So your mm -hmm. suggestion, I do agree with uh, for sure. And people are, you know, they are, were like with the whole premise of testosterone is best. Take as much testosterone as you can, blah, blah, blah. Where in reality, if you need an, an anti-estrogen and, you know, 30 different drugs for, you know, various of things, so your AI will screw up your cholesterol, and then you need yeah, I, to take I, I uh, uh, a statins or uh, uh, or uh, ezetimibe or things like that. Then you're not helping yourself; you're just hooking yourself to more drugs. So uh, the the whole idea is to take the least amount of shit that that you you have to take and get away with it. So yeah, uh, definitely. The less is more. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Um, now I suggest we move on to the last point of our video, and that would be the blood pressure medication. So, for example, mm -hmm. let's say I'm hypertensive. Uh, so let's say you gave me all the diet uh, advices, all the things to like do cardio, do sauna, reduce stress, meditate and all that. Mm -hmm. And now I also have like a good cycle. So I'm not using uh, things that uh, could make me too much hypertensive, but I have a smart androgen sele selection. But let's say uh, nothing of this works. So I'm still hypertensive and uh, there would maybe it would maybe be a good idea to implement some uh, blood pressure medication. So uh, what is your stance on those? So, for example, if you were to give someone a blood pressure medication, what would you give him? Would it be Cialis? Would it be uh, an ACE inhibitor? Would it be an ARB like tell me Sartan, Low Sartan, or I don't know what Sartan? <laughs> so, yeah, what yeah. what would it be like? What is your stance on uh, blood pressure medications? And so uh, which medical... which do you and which yeah, do you so... find most effective? Right. Oh, sorry, my light. Oh shit. 
Sorry. <laughs> My light went off. Shit. Uh, it still see me looks here? good. Yeah, it's still good. Okay. No okay, problem. Yeah, yeah we'll Just carry on, I guess. Uh, so, first of all, from a medical standpoint, the first line of therapy usually are ACE inhibitors plus diuretics or ARB uh, inhibitors, uh, and your uh, density receptor blockers, ARBs with diuretics. Like that's what nephrologists and cardiologists give to their patients as a first line of therapy. Now, uh, mm-hmm. in the recent years, uh, ARBs have, have had a better uh, clinical outcome from a side effect perspective. So like they're less likely to, uh, to give patients uh, angioedema, uh, you know, hyperkalemia, things like that, than ACE inhibitors. So, and also they tend to be more protective from, um, from, a, uh, from a protein urea aspect. So like they do have a better effect in uh, attenuating protein loss. Um, so like telmisartan would be a good drug of choice for, for starters. Um, I don't like diuretics, even though doctors, you know, give them as the, as the first and second line of therapy. Uh, because we're athletes, you know, if we're screwing with electrolytes, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're excreting a lot of sweat, a lot of uh, uh, electrolyte loss when we're training, we have high body mass index. And in general, uh, diuretics are not a smart idea for us unless it's absolutely necessary. If you're overly bloated or have edema, then, you know, you have to take a diuretic. But otherwise, I would stay the hell away from them. Um, usually... Uh, and uh, there, there's a lot of evidence to support this. If ARBs are not uh, are not facilitating the appropriate uh, outcome that we want, we can pair low dose of ACE inhibitors like enalapril with an ARB like telmisartan, and they have like a synergistic effect. So blocking blocking both uh, uh, and uh, combining ACE inhibitor and an ARB does have some better effects on on, on renal protection. So mm-hmm. outside of that, if the, for, you know, whatever reason, there's further problems and they're not necessarily mediated through just edema or water tension, then we may look into something like alpha blockers or calcium channel blockers just for the short term or something like a propanol, which is a beta blocker. But, but I don't like them because they're only indicated... Uh, when ejection fraction is lowered, when the there's a problem with the with the heart function, uh, you know, in the bodybuilding world right now, people are taking a lot of beta blockers and things like that, which are not necessarily indicated for that purpose, for blood pressure uh, management. They're they're like fourth line of therapy. So if if you still have problems, then maybe utilizing a very low dose of uh, of Cialis or Anything that goes through the uh, NO pathway, uh, improve blood flow like that. But in general, I think it should be addressed and found the root cause. Because if you ha- if you have problems with blood pressure on an ARP and AC inhibitor, you know, combination, then there's really something going off. You know, there's something fundamentally wrong with you mm-hmm. that you need to, you know, uh, define wh- what's the issue and then really, you know, uh, delve into it in, in depth. Yeah, I have also heard that uh, when you were was talking about uh, beta blockers, uh, they can. Is it really that they can uh, actually hurt your performance in the gym? First of oh, all, because, for sure. Yeah, because they slow down your heart rate, and uh, they they are kind of the opposite. Uh, they do the opposite that uh, clan. That clan right? does. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. So if if clan improves your performance and uh, does all that, you know that kind of like beta blockers do the opposite, I guess, and make so, you... So, so we have beta 1, 2, and 3 receptors. Uh, Clean is a beta 2 receptor agonist. When people take beta blockers, they usually take beta 1 or beta 1 and 2 uh, blockers. Um, and the thing that happens is when you take them, they cause peripheral vasoconstriction, they cause bronchoconstriction, so in the lungs, your lung capacity will drop, that's the opposite of cleanse use, right? Then they can uh, impact thyroid function and metabolic rate. They can cause orthostatic hypotension. They can negatively impact your cardiovascular performance uh, because when we're, let's say, in the gym, we do need that 
uh, uh, that drive from catecholamines, from noradrenaline, from adrenaline, in order to be explosive, in order to, you know, be on top of our, you know, on, on our lifting schedule and training protocols. So we, we do not necessarily want to screw with that. Um, and there's a, um, there's a whole cascade of problems that they can, uh, they can cause even from an immunological standpoint, because all of these drugs, especially blood pressure medications, are, are, um, are tied in with, uh, with conditions such as drug-induced lupus, for example. I have uh, uh, systemic lupus, which is an autoimmune condition, and I've read a, a lot about it, obviously. And a lot of these drugs can cause uh, the, almost the same symptoms. That's why it calls uh, uh, lupus-like syndrome or drug-induced lupus. So they can cause problems in our body that are basically a, an autoimmune response. And, you know, if it, when this happens, it's very difficult for somebody to actually explain to themselves what the fuck is going on. So, like, you may take something that's like a, uh, like hydrolazine or, or even minoxid or beta blocker, and you start getting, you know, uh, joint pain, arthritis, myalgia, uh, you know, problems like fever, like low-grade fever, things like that, and how the fuck would you know that you know it's it's the 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 drug that your doctor prescribed you for you know better uh yeah, you yeah. know cardiovascular management or what like you wouldn't even think that this may cause all of these other cascading issues so those are that's why they're risky and if you look at the side effects from them a lot of them have you know uh, weight gain uh you know uh, periorbital edema water retention uh, mm. uh, throbbing uh, uh, tingling of the hands so that basically means that there is impaired uh, 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 vascular uh, outflow in the extremities. They can cause erectile dysfunction. Beta blockers can cause nightmares. And that's because they upregulate alpha adrenergic receptor signaling. So that's why if you look up uh, uh, Brazosin, which is an alpha-1 blocker, it's prescribed for nightmares and erectile dysfunction, whereas blo blocking beta receptors actually increases alpha-1 <laughs> signaling so that's you know these things are very interesting and they if you understand the whole concept of how uh, uh these receptors work um you 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 can you can see you know how what one thing can cause you know a whole cascading events and how many problems down the road that people do not even think of, you know they don't mm. even consider that yeah so uh i don't that's why i also don't, don't like cialis and things like that you know because a, a lot of them are also um they can uh, they have negative interactions with things like alcohol for example and a lot of the drugs that we're taking uh and injecting obviously they have a lot of artificial alcohols like benzo 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 alcohol uh so i i had a friend that he had a heart attack in the gym he was you know blasting steroids and taking viagra for better pumps and like he did leg day and the dude was like, you know, had heart problems, uh, uh, problems breathing. He was, you know, hyperventilating, uh, dripping cold sweats, you know, goes home, takes a shower and then collapses. His brother takes him to the hospital and, you know, he had a heart attack. So, you know. But is, is, is he okay now? Yeah, yeah. They, no. I think they, they put a stand. Uh, but like he's 29, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of But fucked what, up what would you it. say what was the primary cause? Uh, the... I, I think, I think that the issue was uh, uh, being on cycle, being on, on steroids, being in a very hot environment, like a gym, obviously, during summertime and taking, I don't know whether, when, like when you take Viagra, I don't know what dose he took or Salis, whatever, that can cause a... Uh, uh, a uh, reflex baroreceptor stimulation. So that's a, a, a reflex tachycardia from the drop of blood pressure. And that increases the heart rate and you feel it like pounding in your ears, you know, hyperventilating. Oh, yeah. And in conjunction with the nandrol and an anadrol he was on, like that's a recipe for pro for cardiovascular events, you know, because mm -hmm. like we don't know how one drug may affect us, but when you have, you know, five other drugs, it's very hard to see what we can cause, you know, on a cellular level, on a, uh, or even, or even just in general, on a, on a surface level, like how those would interact. Uh, and we also have different genetic, you know, polymorphisms, different metabolism, uh, metabolism. So, you know, there are a lot of variables that we cannot account for 
not even consider accounting for. Even if you want to, it's very hard to, to, to pinpoint everything. So the more variables you have, especially when we're talking about drugs that directly impact the heart function, it's kind of scary. Like if you can get away without using them, just don't use them. Yeah, you know? of course. So, yeah. So, yeah, I think we've covered everything now. Uh, just before we before we end the podcast, I would like mm -hmm. you to just conclude everything that we speak about today, but mm -hmm. on short, if possible. So you're not just sure. like uh, discussing everything on long again. Uh, right. So in like five minutes, if you can just like conclude everything on short, right. then we end the video. Right. So to wrap things up, we need to basically uh, uh, define where we define our blood pressure or base, baseline blood pressure. We want to have di different various of, of measurements throughout the days over, you know, a period of a week and or week or two, and then repeat the whole process within like the next two months, three months and whatever, and gather data like that, not just one measurement. If we're noticing that something's off, we need to, you know, try to directly attenuate it you know, rather than just letting things build up. As far as our, you know, uh, uh, approaches to things, we need to maintain a lighter body weight, regardless whether that's even bulking. So we want to take uh, a, a rational approach to bulking, you know, slight caloric surplus, not overly exerting ourselves with junk food, with shit like that. Uh, picking our, our drugs smart, so not do not take, you know, highly water intensive drugs. So, uh, you know, a, a baseline dose of testosterone in conjunction with some DHTs or like EQ or things like that that are, you know, uh, less that cause a lesser burden on the raw system then we need to monitor our blood viscosity. So, you know, uh, uh, looking at platelets, red blood cell count, hemoglobin levels, prothrombotic time, you know, just in general to have a, a, an eye on blood, blood viscosity. Then we need to have an emphasis and an eye on uh, proper hydration. So proper water intake, you know, proper potassium to sodium ratio and, and, and magnesium intake. And then, you know, being focused on uh, having a low uh, stressful uh, uh, lifestyle, meditating, you know, trying naturally to put us in a parasympathetic nervous system state rather than, you know, being on the edge all the time. So just relax, calm down, you know, uh, do activities that are, you know, uh, uh, beneficial to our nervous system and our brain, walking, you know, with our dogs, whatever, being, you know, being, being more chill in general. Uh, trying to avoid stimulant use to the best of our capabilities. And when we do use stimulants, make them uh, the, mo the, the absolute most out of them and, and pick them smart. So do not take stimulants with a very long uh, half-life uh, and do not you know, opt for very hard stimulants. So the, the least uh, adrenergic stimulants we take, the better, just in general. So uh, then we can also uh, uh, focus on supplementing in general, supplements that would increase the stemming inflammation, things that uh, uh, will address, uh, that would help the liver and kidneys, uh, glutathione, and acetylcysteine, otka, uh, citrus bergamot, cranberry extract, garlic, high omega-3 uh, diet, you know, so low in, uh, inflammatory state uh, diet, um, trying to not eat junk food, uh, keeping keeping an eye on uh, on our glucose levels so you know not not to go into insulin resistance doing cardio year round you know preferably daily or every other day at the least you know for whatever you know 30 minutes per day just to to be on top of our game um and i think that's that's something that the like, and and from a pharmaceutical standpoint in every if everything else fails then you know put an emphasis on you know standard protocols like an arp in conjunction maybe with, uh, if that doesn't work with a low dose of AC inhibitor, uh, try to avoid diuretics unless absolutely necessary. Uh, and, you know, monitor heart health, you know, in organ imaging, you know, do an ultrasound, uh, do an AKG, monitor your kidneys, monitor your heart, your parameters, your uh, left ventricular hypertrophy state. Um, and overall, you know, just in general, uh, focus on, on, on every metric that you deem uh, relevant uh, w when discussing uh, blood pressure. And I think everything that we touched upon pretty much sums everything up. There, We may have, you know, 
uh, overlook something. But in general, if all of these things are addressed and be, uh, if we're mindful of, I think, you know, n almost nobody will have significant problems in this area. Okay. Thank you, Alec. I think that is it for today's podcast. Um, it was a pleasure. Yeah, to me too. So really appreciate you came on my channel and shared your knowledge with all of us. So uh, for you guys, don't forget to like, subscribe, comment to support the channel's growth. More videos are coming, more podcasts are coming now when I started them. So yeah, I apologize for a little bit bad lightning and me being kind of nervous for the first time. But like, I'm not used to filming uh, this kind of uh, videos yet. You know, when I'm filming my YouTube videos, I can like re-record or how to say like i can delete it and film it again so it's not like uh it's once filmed and then it's published you know so uh now it is like that so that's why i was like a little bit nervous at the start but we'll work on it like with everything like with things in the gym like progressive overload with with everything so new podcasts are be will be better for sure um and yeah thank you for watching the podcast if you made it uh, up until now and see you in next video bye guys